Chapter 11 Cass did not travel with Link the next day, as Link rode while he flew. Link found that he liked the Rito, for all the discomfort that their meeting had caused the day prior. Thankfully, Cass seemed to understand that the subject of the calamity was a sensitive one for him, and it was not brought up again. And despite some nervous curiosity, Link never asked what Cass knew of his actual past. With both of those uncomfortable topics out of the way, however, they were able to speak much more comfortably with each other as the night wore on, and Link was able to find out some key information about Hyrule that he hadn't gotten yet from the others that he'd met. Still, though, as he set out the next morning, he found himself hoping that Cass would have moved on from Zora's domain by the time he reached it in three or four days' time. It would make it much easier for Link to engage with the Divine Beast without having to worry about a traveling minstrel passing word of his deeds all over the land. That was, of course, assuming he would be able to figure out what exactly he needed to do with the Divine Beast. And that he would even need to survive the attempt. As the sun began to dip towards the west, Link saw the first signs of oncoming rain. The dark mass of clouds were just visible over the mountains surrounding Zora's domain. I guess we've got another soggy night ahead of us, he said, patting Spirit's neck. The horse turned its head, looking back at Link with one large brown eye. If I can find shelter, I will. Spirit snorted turning his head forward again. Link pursed his lips, but then thought better of it. He was the one who had taken to talking to his horse and interpreting its responses after all. But the rain did not come that night. In fact, it didn't seem to grow any closer as they continued on, and the sun set. When he woke the next morning to see the mass of roiling rain clouds still present over Zora's domain, he realized that this was something different, something concerning, potentially far worse than a cold and wet night. The river that he traveled parallel to gradually began to swell, the water line growing higher and the current stronger. As he got closer to Zora's domain, finally reaching the point that it began to spill over its banks. More than once, Link had to carefully guide Spirit through the shallow water that had washed out the road. Finally, in the early afternoon of his third day out from Kokarika Village, the world grew dark and wet. He had ridden into the rain which had still not moved from its spot over Zora's domain. The clouds, nearly black overhead, spat rain in an unending deluge that almost immediately soaked through Link's cloak and clothes. The road grew muddy and treacherous, and Spirit's hooves made loud sucking noises each time they lifted up out of the muck. Link could see the Sheikah Tower in the distance, but didn't dare try to climb it. Instead, he leaned low over Spirit's saddle, patting the horse's neck with a comforting hand. Spirit had grown agitated ever since entering the rain, and he could hardly blame him. Nothing about this rain felt natural. It was too heavy to be this consistent. But for all the heavy rain, there was no other indications of a storm. No lightning, no thunder, and no wind to speak of. Just a steady, torrential downpour. He wasn't at all sure how long it took before he saw the bridge. It crossed over the river, which had grown extremely violent now that he was in the midst of the rain. The bridge was made of white stone and was flanked on either side by a pair of beautiful watchtowers. The watchtowers each had a base made of slightly translucent crystal that shone with an inner blue white light. Gray stone crisscrossed up the white crystal before forming a platform at the top, as well as a central pillar that rose up, topped with another crystal that likewise shone with a blue white light. The effect was stunning, and Link knew that when he crossed the bridge, he would be within Zora's domain. Disconcertingly, he did not find either watchtower manned by one of the aquatic race, something that he felt was probably a bad omen. Cass had spoken of troubles with the Divine Beast, and now this rain. Link worried that he had somehow been too late. The roar of the river under them nearly drowned out the clip-clop of Spirit's hooves as they crossed the stone bridge and into Zora's domain. The muddy road continued after the bridge, circling around a wider section of the river that spilled over its banks, covering part of the road in water. Grimacing, Link pushed Spirit on through the shallows, to where the road circled around the face of a sheer rock wall. As he rounded the wall, something felt off to him. He felt a prickling at the back of his neck, as if he were being watched. He looked around, frowning. 
he had rounded another corner as the path looped back, climbing to the top of the wall he had just passed by. Thick trees lined either side of the road, their branches bending low under the weight of the rainwater. Puddles formed on the path, and Spirit's hooves splashed loudly as he crossed through them. Cautiously, Link drew his sword and shield. Instinct told him that he was being watched, and he scanned the trees all around. Nothing moved, with the exception of the heavy-laden tree branches. Rain continued to fall, making it difficult to see very far into the trees, and the water constantly dripping into his eyes. His sodden hood sagged, and he reached up, attempting to straighten it. It did not help much. To make matters worse, night had begun to fall. Everything grew darker, further obscuring the forest. He was being watched. Link was certain of it. He felt their eyes on him, waiting for the opportune to strike. He felt blind. After several tense minutes of waiting, Link chose to press on as the trees around him fell into darkness. He had no torch or lantern, and neither would likely work well in this rain. So he was forced to rely on his own limited night vision to see the path. Spirit, thankfully, needed little guidance and seemed to feel the same unease that Link did. He moved at a brisker pace than before, despite the way that his hooves sank deeply into the mud with every step. The rain's muffling effect was likely the reason he didn't hear the battle much earlier. In fact, it wasn't until he was nearly upon it that he saw the hazy blue lanterns that had been thrown to the ground and heard the clash of metal weapons upon metal shields. However, as he rounded a small bend in the trees, finally seeing these things, several things happened all at once. Movement ahead. A group of shapes, some standing tall with silvery weapons and shields, and some hunched low to the ground wielding weapons of black metal, clashed with surprising speed. Something hissed from the trees to Link's left. Someone screamed. Something hit Link with enough force to drive him off his spirit's back and onto the ground. That he'd already had his sword and shield ready saved his life. For a moment, Link thrashed with the thing on top of him, which seemed to be all sharp teeth and claws. The thing's attacks were wild, however, and Link had his shield between his body and the thing attacking him, which protected him from the worst of the attacks. The attacks weakened after a few moments, and the creature released a pained hiss before finally slumping. Link's sword had pierced the creature's gut when it had pounced on Link, and the creature's own thrashing likely only hastened its demise. Disgusted, he shoved the creature, which was larger than him by at least a head, off and rolled to his feet. Nearby, Spirit stamped his feet nervously and ahead, the two forces clashed. Vaguely illuminated by the blue lanterns on the ground, Link could see that the taller individuals matched up with what he'd seen and heard of the Zora. Skin of varying hues of blue and red, with long legs and arms ending in webbed appendages, fins at the elbows, and heads of various shapes, each with their own fins and tail-like protuberances at the back. The enemies that they faced were large and lizard-like, with long hunched torsos, long snouts with razor teeth, and wicked claws on their feet and toes. The Zora were outnumbered, surrounded on all sides by their lizard foes, who appeared to have attacked from the trees. However, the Zora were clearly the more skilled group, having fallen into a circle formation with their backs to each other, each wielding a long silver spear and silver shield, with enough sharp edges to be a weapon in its own right. Their blue lanterns had each been dropped in a circle around the group of Zora, providing enough illumination to see any approaching enemy. As Link watched, one of the lizards lunged forward, trying to stab a Zora with a spear of its own. But in perfect coordination, the Zora blocked the attack with her shield, while her partner beside her thrust his spear into the lizard's chest. In Link's brief estimation, it seemed to him that the Zora, with their strong defensive line and coordination, would be the victors in this fight without his assistance. However, a moment later he saw a flash of yellow light from within the tree line. Shock arrows! The cry came from someone within the Zora circle, and the group immediately broke, diving for cover. A yellow-tipped arrow shot out from the trees, landing in a puddle right where the group of Zora had been standing. There was a flash of light, and yellow arcs of electricity danced across the puddle. One of the Zora had been too slow, his foot still in the puddle when the arrow struck. He screamed in agony, body growing rigid as the arcs of electricity shot up his body. Raven! One Zora, that stood slightly taller than the rest, threw aside his spear and dove for the Zora that had been frozen in place by the electrical current. When they collided, there was a flash of lightning, and the tall Zora cried out, even as he succeeded in tackling the other Zora out of the puddle. Link sprinted into the forest where the arrow had come from. 
they found a dark-skinned lizard preparing to string another of the yellow-tipped arrows. Its last, as evidenced by the empty quiver at its waist. He thrust his sword into the creature's side, causing it to hiss in fury, dropping the bow and arrow before leaping back and pulling free of Link's sword. The creature placed a clawed hand against its pierced side, looking down at it, and then up again at him. Its eyes seemed to catch some faint light and shone in the dark night. Link had really hoped that his thrust would be fatal. It would appear, however, that this night just wasn't going the way he had hoped. The lizard rushed forward, hunching over and zigzagging across the ground with shocking speed. It had no weapons, so it brandished its claws in a deadly manner. Thinking to end the fight quickly, Link slashed, but the lizard dodged to the side easily before leaping towards him, hissing loudly. He deflected one of the claws with his shield, but a flare of pain in his arm told him that the other struck home. He set his jaw against the pain and stumbled back. The lizard gave him no chance to catch his breath. It leaped forward, teeth filled maw open and aimed for his throat. He ducked and sidestepped, narrowly avoiding its attack. They traded blows for a time, neither quite gaining the advantage. Though Link was an excellent swordsman, the muddy terrain and darkness seemed to favor the lizard. He managed to catch the lizard's tail, cutting off the last foot or so of the writhing appendage. The lizard hissed furiously, whirling and slashing its claws. One of its hands grabbed the lip of his shield and ripped it free of his forearm. He spun away from it, swinging his sword in a wide arc, and the lizard jumped back. It bent low, hissing its threat while its eyes reflected the pale light of the blue lanterns behind him on the path. Link waited. The lizard didn't. It leaped, its clawed feet forward, talons angled toward his chest. He sidestepped and swept his sword up, into the monster's chest, cutting deep. The lizard's body folded over his blade, and its momentum ripped Link's sword out of his hand. The lizard hit the ground and rolled to a stop. He didn't wait to see if it would rise. He raced toward it, pulling free the guardian sword from the Sheikah Shrine. The blade appeared, glowing brilliantly blue and humming, and he turned it upside down, plunging it down into the lizard's prone body. The lizard spasmed violently, kicking out with clawed legs and arms, and then grew limp. He retrieved his fallen sword and placed the guardian sword back at his waist. Sounds and shadows from the path alerted him to the ongoing fight there, so he found the spot where the lizard had been providing overwatch. There, he was dismayed to see that the battle had gone poorly for the Zora after the electric arrow strike. Two of the Zora were down, and the remaining Zora had formed up around them, but injuries or exhaustion had clearly slowed their reflexes. As he watched, one of the lizards rushed forward, dodging a spear thrust, and slashed one of the Zora in the thigh with its claws. She cried out, falling to one knee as her companion warded the lizard back with his spear. Link sheathed his sword and snatched up the lizard's discarded bow and yellow-tipped arrow. As he drew the arrow, he was surprised to see its tip burst into light, crackling with electric energy. His arm spasm as the electric energy, not contained to just the arrow tip, lanced back into his hand. The shock nearly made him release his grip on the arrow, but he set his jaw and turned his aim on a group of lizards that were preparing to launch another attack on the Zora. Remembering the tactic used earlier, he aimed low for the puddle of water they stood in, and loosed the arrow. The relief in his arm when he released the arrow was immediate, and he dropped the bow and flexed his fingers. The arrow flew true, striking the water with a small splash and a bright flash of electrical light. The lizards caught completely unaware, hissed in agony, as arcs of electrical energy ran up their bodies. For one frozen moment, the remaining Zora and lizards turned, confused at the state of the other foes, who began to collapse, still twitching from the electric shock. Then the Zora rallied, and broke from their defensive circle, bellowing war cries. The remaining lizards, confused by their fallen brethren, stood no chance and were quickly cut down by the silvery Zora's spears. Link stepped out of the trees slowly, and when the Zora contingent turned their spears on him, he raised his hands in a non-threatening gesture. Like he expected, the Zora all glanced at each other before lowering their spears. What he hadn't expected was one of the Zora to suddenly say, Link? Is that you? Link? The Zora with the hurt leg looked up, eyes widening. Her skin was a pale violet color, different from the others. Link? It can't be. He died when... Another Zora looked at him, his expression confused. The light of recognition shone in his eyes. By the goddess. 
Link stood frozen. Somehow these Zora, at least some of them, seemed to know exactly who he was. The group of Zora appeared to see the confusion on his face, for a dark blue-skinned member approached, smiling. It's me, Baz. You might actually not recognize me. I was a lot younger when you last saw me, and it's been one hundred years. It's... The Zora named Baz frowned. It's been one hundred years, and you don't look a day different from the last time I saw you. That's not normal for Hylians, is it? I... I don't... Link sputtered, his eyes wide. He suddenly regretted ever agreeing to Zora's domain. Why hadn't someone told him that there would be Zora alive that he'd still recognized him? How was that even possible? He didn't know much, or really any, about Zora physiology. But shouldn't they look older? Gadison, it can't be him, one of the Zora said, looking at the violet-shaded female Zora. He's dead. Riven, look at him, said the violet Zora named Gaddison. I am, and I don't remember any of you, Link said. There was no point in letting this go on longer than it needed to. I am who you think I am, but I... I don't have any memories. Silence followed his pronouncement. Several pairs of Zora eyes fell on Link, and he cursed whatever gods brought him to this point. He cursed Impa and Pura for not preparing him. He even began to curse the princess for even saving him in the first place, but stopped himself. A pair of webbed hands clasped together, causing the contingents of Zora to stand up straighter. The tallest Zora, red-skinned and with epaulets somehow stuck to his shoulders, walked around from behind the other Zora, smiling broadly, and revealing a row of sharp teeth. Well, I, for one, don't care who you used to be, he said, walking over. Abruptly, the Zora reached out, taking Link's hand and shook it enthusiastically. Because you just saved our lives. If you hadn't come along when you did, I'm not sure we would have all made it out of here alive. The tall Zora, still shaking Link's hand, looked back at the others. Godsman, we owe this highly in our lives. But it wouldn't do to just stand here, waiting for another group of the Zalvos to ambush us, would it? His voice carried an air of relaxed authority. Spread out. Search the woods. I think we've patrolled far enough, so we will begin our trek back home in the morning. The others were saluted by placing fists to their chests before spreading out and walking into the trees on either side of the road. As he passed, the Zora named Baz placed a hand on Link's shoulder, squeezing it firmly before continuing on into the trees. Once the other Zora were gone, the taller Zora finally released Link's hand, still grinning. He glanced around briefly, before lowering his head and speaking in a softer tone. Better? Link looked up at him in confusion, but the Zora seemed to get the answer he was looking for, because he stood tall again. Link, is it? Link nodded. The Zora had a unique look about him. Two ridges extended to the sides like small, rigid wings from his snout, just above his eyes and the tail fin on the back of his head ran all the way down to the middle of his back. Unlike the other Zora that Link had seen, he also had an additional dorsal fin extended up from the top of his head, as well as a piece of silvery ornamentation that Link thought might be the Zora version of a crown. Excellent. I am Sidon, Prince of Zara's Domain, and you are exactly who I have been looking for. You knew I was coming? Link said, frowning. Oh no. Sedan seemed to always be smiling, his voice cheerful. But we Zora have been in a bit of a spot lately. The Divine Beast. Sedan laughed hardly. So you've heard? Yes, Luta has been quite angry lately. She is the one causing all of this rain, and I am worried that, if you do not put a stop to it soon, the East Reservoir will overflow, flooding both Zora's domain and a good portion of Hyrule at that. A chill ran down Link's back. Flood Zora's domain? Flood Hyrule? That's why I'm here, actually. I've been sent on a mission to regain control of the Divine Beasts. Excellent! His outburst startled Link, but the Zora Prince didn't seem to notice. He clapped his hands together enthusiastically. Really, that is wonderful. I'm certain that my father would be thrilled to hear of it. And maybe now the old demon sergeant can stop electrocuting himself with shock arrows. Prince Sedan... I... Oh, you can just call me Sedan. Everyone does. 
All right, Sidon. If you could tell me how to get to the Divine Beast, I'll begin that way and... Oh, no. It's much too late for that, man. We will make camp tonight and begin back to the Domain in the morning. My father would like to speak to you. He always spoke very highly of you, and well, Sidon's composure faltered, but only for a moment. I'm sure he would like to speak with you about my sister. Your sister? Mifa. It felt as if a cold hand wrapped around Link's heart and squeezed. Prince Sidon, Princess Mifa, the Zora King. Impa must have known, hadn't she? She would have known what Link was walking into. Why hadn't she said anything? Why hadn't anyone thought to prepare him for this? Absently, he nodded, which Sidon readily accepted with another exclamation of, Wonderful! Link felt anything but wonderful at the moment. It rained all night, something that didn't seem to bother the Zora at all. They all slept easily on the ground while Link huddled under the tree with the thickest canopy that he could find. His attempt at a lean-to did not provide much, if any, relief from the rain, and there was no hope in crafting a fire either. The Zora caught fish from the river, eating them raw. They offered some of the river's bounty to Link, but he shook his head, choosing to eat his leftover travel rations. Thankfully, no more Lazolfos attacked that night. Several of the Zora had been wounded in the fight, but none were serious, though Riven still appeared dazed from the shock he received. Zora, it appeared, were very susceptible to electrocution, confirmed to him by Sidon, who asked with some amazement at the way Link was able to use the Lizolfo's shock arrows against them. Many of the Zora that followed Sidon had, apparently, known Link before the calamity. In fact, to his surprise, Baz told him that he was actually the individual that taught several of the Zora how to fight with both sword and spear. Sidon had grown excited by that, telling Link that his personal guard were among some of the best warriors that Zora's domain had to offer. Reluctantly, Link told the group of Zora his story. He and the Zora had once been friends, and he felt that he owed them the truth. They listened with rapt attention, and once he was finished, each of them declared with no uncertainty that his lack of memories didn't matter to them. They were just happy that their friends still lived. Link hadn't been sure how to respond to that, and remained silent. The morning brought a gray dawn and more rain and he felt eager to get back on the road. After much discussion among themselves, Sidon sent several Zora swimming upriver back to the city to inform the king of what happened, and of Link's arrival. Sidon and the remaining three Zora, Baz, Gaddison, and Riven, decided instead to walk with him. He had initially resisted riding while they walked, but it became clear to him that they did not have nearly the same amount of trouble that he had moving through the mud. Even though they were taller than Link, their webbed feet seemed to enable them to walk on top of the mud, rather than sinking into it, and the footprints they left were shallow. That day passed more pleasantly than Link had expected. The group of Zora that walked with him were clearly old friends, including Sidon, who laughed and joked as much as the rest of them. They told Link some stories from one hundred years past, too. Link had apparently been just a boy when he first came to Zora's domain with his father, the knight. Baz, Gaddison, and Riven had just been children at the time, and had eagerly played with the boy Link. As years passed, Link grew older, but Zora aged much more slowly than Hylians. Gaddison admitted that she looked to Link like an older brother, which made the two other Zora laugh for some reason. It was because of this apparent maturity gap that Link had taught these three Zora how to fight. They had been considered much too young to learn the ways of combat, but Link had known much even as a child and had gladly shared his knowledge with the children as he got older. Of course, then you visited with the princess, and didn't really have much time for us, Riven said offhandedly. You made time for Mifa, though. Well, of course. Link didn't respond to this exchange, but Sidon looked thoughtful. He admitted that he didn't have any real memories of Link from before. He was younger than the rest of the Zora by at least twenty years, and any memories he had before the Calamity were hazy at best. Link wondered if that meant that he didn't have any memories of Mifa as well. That seemed tragic to him. It wasn't until later that they encountered more Lazolfos. These ones were not as well organized as the previous group, and had no shock arrows, thankfully. Still, though, Link was grateful that he linked up with the group of Zora. He wasn't sure he would have been able to make it up the river without them. Lazolfos fought more viciously than Bokoblins, like instinct-driven beasts 
without fear of death. After the fight, Link asked about the Lizalfos' presence in Zora's domain. Zora and Lizalfos have been sworn enemies, going back countless generations, Sidon said in response, as he wiped his spear clean of green blood after dipping it into a small pond a little off of the road. Legends say that long ago, before Highlands or Gorons ever walked the land, Zora and Lizalfos were at peace with each other. However, in that time, the land was a hot, arid place with little water. The Zora people lived in the water, while the Lizalfos occupied the burning lands. Over time, the Lizalfos began to covet the cooling waters of Zora's river, and demanded the Zora give them half of the waters. The Zora, at the time, agreed to share the distributaries off the main river, but were unwilling to give up the river itself, where their children played, and the best fish were to be had. The Lizalfos did not accept this, however, and decided to attack the Zora, determined to drive them out of the river entirely. The two tribes clashed many times, but the Lizalfos were never able to achieve their ultimate goals and drive the Zora from the waters. Eventually, while the Zora grew older and wiser, the Lizalfo tribe split due to end-fighting. Some travelled west to the desert, hoping to find another source of water on the other side, while others migrated to the mountains, hoping for relief from the burning heat of the land and the snowcaps. Some, however, would forever remain near Zora's domain, remembering the time, ages past, when Zora and Lizalfos fought over the great river. Though the land is no longer arid, and many of the streams have now become rivers in their own right, these Lizalfos still seek to drive the Zora from the land and claim the river's source for their own. There were a few moments of silence after Sidon's tale ended, before the prince grinned toothily. Or so the Zoras say. Personally, I think they are merely a bunch of stupid lizards with a desire to meet the end of my spear. The other Zora laughed and cheered their prince, and Link smiled faintly. Sidon waited for a few moments for his guards to move away, back towards the road, preparing to continue their journey north. Once they were out of earshot, he looked at Link, his expression grim. The truth is that the Lizalfos are growing stronger, he said. Link looked at him with a frown. They used to be little more than animals, and were easy to deal with, but lately they have been gathering together in larger bands. Twenty years ago, they would have never created an ambush like the one we found ourselves in yesterday. They've grown smarter, and their tactics are changing. How bad is it? Link said, moving a half-step closer. It's hard to say but I'm not sure I've ever seen such a large group as the one we just fought this far up the river. I will have to report it to my father and arrange for more patrols. Varuta's reign has only seemed to embolden them. Sedan, with a grim smile, placed a hand on Link's shoulder before moving off to join the other Zora. Troubled, Link walked back to Spirit, gripping the sodden saddle carefully and pulling himself up. Spirit snorted, clearly as unhappy with the rain as he was and he patted the horse's neck soothingly. Almost there, boy. The late afternoon brought with it the first sight of the Great Zora Bridge. The day's travel had taken them across several bridges, each a beautiful work of stone masonry, but nothing compared to the final bridge spanning the last lake of the river to its above-ground source. As they rounded a mountain called Rudo Mountain, Link was surprised to see just how high above the river they were now. A rock bridge crossed from the mountain across the river far below, to a rocky island pillar in the middle of Zora River. It was from this pillar that the Great Zora Bridge began. The bridge itself was at least a mile long, if not longer, a marvel of engineering in its own right before one considered the fact that it had no apparent supports. Instead, it was built into the side of the pillar and extended all the way up the rest of the Zora River over a massive waterfall to connect with the large city of Zora's domain. The city was far enough away that the rain obscured it, leaving Link with only a few faint impressions of its design and size. The bridge was made of beautiful white and gray stone, just as the towers had been, with stone arches placed equidistant from each other along its length. Each pillar was beautifully carved stone with a glowing white gem placed at its peak, providing light to those traveling by night. The sight of the bridge alone was breathtaking, but walking upon it was even more awe-inspiring. 
and bordering on terrifying. He dismounted Spirit when they reached the bridge, taking the horse's reins and guiding him onto the bridge. He wasn't at all sure that he would want to ride across the bridge, if he could help it. The river was incredibly far below them. Link wasn't even sure his grip on paraglider could hold out long enough for him to reach the bottom if he fell off. Any fear that he felt, however, was quickly overshadowed by the simple amazement that he felt as he walked across the stone. Ah, to be able to see it for the first time, Sidon said, smiling. Or at least the first time you can remember, hmm? Link glanced toward him, and for the first time in a while the mention of his lack of memories didn't really bother him. Sidon was right. This was a spectacle that he was glad that he couldn't remember seeing before. Just wait, said Baz, nodding toward the distant, shadowy shape of their city. You haven't seen anything yet. They walked along the bridge, rain pouring steadily down upon them for the next ten minutes before Zora's domain began to take shape. As they got closer, Link began to see hints of platforms and walkways, stone pillars, and something massive rising up from its center. The closer he got, the more the city came into view and the less he even noticed the rain pouring down on him. Even under the shadow of rain clouds, the city was beautiful. It was built in several ring-shaped tiers, with various stone walkways that circled around the rings in a complex system of walkways and platforms. Still far ahead, the bridge terminated on the lowest tier, which opened into a wide plaza, at the center of which was what appeared to be a large fountain that he could only just barely make out. This bottom tier was the largest, extending far beyond the plaza and forming the city's foundation. It was on this tier that the winding walkways that encircled the city and connected to various platforms in the upper tiers began. A pair of half-circle staircases rose from either side of the plaza, rising up to the second tier of Zora's domain. Here, from what Link could see, was a hub for many of the city's walkways to converge. Bridges connected to the distant walls of the basin that Zora's domain was situated in, like the spokes of a great wheel. In the far distance, Link could make out even more structures built along the bridges and along the walls. The city's uppermost level was taken up by the magnificent Shining Palace. This was a building that Link had seen before, in the photo gallery on the Sheikah Slate, but a photograph had done nothing to show the true majesty of what he saw now. It was designed like an enormous fish, its tail flipped up and curling over its head. Hundreds, if not thousands, of silvery scales had been carved into the fish's body, its tail fin glowed brightly in the same blue-white way that many other Zora structures had, shining its hazy light down on the palace from above. The fish's mouth made the entrance to the palace, open for all to see, though the rain made it hard for Link to actually see what lay within. The entire city was suspended above a large pool of water below, the source of the river, by large white pillars of stone. The pillars seemed far too thin for how large the city was, but he knew from what he'd been told that it had held for thousands of years without fail. It was surrounded on all sides by massive cliffs of stone and shimmering crystal that reflected the gray clouds overhead. The city was beautiful, and Link had most certainly seen it before, not just in a photograph nor in a memory, but somewhere deep in the recesses of Link's mind. He knew that he'd been here before. He'd seen that palace before. He'd walked upon the walkways. He'd played... Come on, Baz! You'll need to be faster if you want to beat me. A flash through his mind, sprinting along a walkway that overlooked a great lake. One misstep and he would fall over the edge. But when did a child think of such things? So down, Link. If you're not careful, you'll... Link! A slip of his foot. A lurch, sudden open air. And a hand that gripped his arm with a firm, secure grip. You must be careful, little one. A Hylian such as you would have trouble with that dive. Golden eyes. Red fins that draped to either side of a round face. Golden jewelry that hung down the sides of the fins. A warm smile. Thank you, Lady Mifa. I tried warning him. Zora's domain. Baz. Mifa. All flashed through Link's head in a whirl of sounds and colors. It was enough to make him stumble placing a hand against Spirit's thick neck for support. Ahead, the contingent of Zora paused, though none looked back at him. Why, here comes Musu. Perhaps the old Manta was worried about me. He could remember being at Zora's domain before. He'd been young, merely a child. And Baz had been one too. 
they'd been running on the walkways that extended out from the sides of Zora's domain. A dangerous place for a Hylian such as him to be playing. He'd stubbed his toe on a stair, stumbled, nearly fallen off, and then... Prince Sedon! Mipha. He could remember her face, not from a photograph, but a true memory. He could remember her voice. It was only one brief memory of her, the smallest of glimpses of her warm face. But he hung on to that memory. It was more than anything he'd gotten so far, even if this memory had also been disjointed and confused like the one before. What is it, Muzu? Why do you look so alarmed? Has something happened? He wanted to remember more of her. He'd been a child in this memory. But one of when he was older. What of their travels as champions? He thought of the photograph of the four champions, Princess Zelda and him all gathered together. Had they been close? Had they been friends? Prince, I implore you. You must eject this Hylian from our domain at once. He is not welcome here. Link's thoughts crashed around him as he focused, again on the scene before him. Sedan, Baz, Riven, and Gaddison all stood in front of him, facing another group of Zoras. The center Zora, with a wide, flat head with eyes far to either side, stared at Link with what looked like barely contained rage. To the other side of him were another pair of much older Zora, each carrying a spear. They, too, looked at Link with hatred and gripped their spears in tight fists. Musir, what has gotten into you? Sedan said. Do you know who this is? Oh, I know full well who he is, Prince Sedan. This man, the one named Muzu spat, pointing a tremulous finger at Link, is the one responsible for your sister's death. The beautiful, smiling image of Mipha that Link could still see in his mind shattered. <laughs>